Would you take your Bible and turn with me this morning to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Thank you, men, for that music. We've been studying now for several weeks Paul's letter to the church at Colossae that the Spirit of God led him to write. And this little letter speaks to us about living for Jesus and how to live the Christian life. And it is as relevant today as it was the day it was written. And we've learned that if we're going to live for Jesus, that means several things. First, it means that we're going to live the abundant life that Jesus said that he came for us to live. And that abundant life, we have learned, is a life of faith, a life of hope, and a life of love. Then we learn that if we're really going to live for Jesus, that we are going to fulfill the purpose that we've been placed upon the earth to fulfill. And God makes that purpose clear to us in His Word. There are two reasons that God has every believer on the earth, and that is first, to know Jesus Christ, and second, to make Jesus Christ known. And the only reason God does not take us on to heaven when we're saved is to leave us here so that we can take the Jesus that we know and we make Him known. And then last week in our study, we learned about the importance of the preeminence of Jesus. And if we're really going to live for Him, that means putting Him first in every area of our life. That means giving Him priority over everything in our life. And so today we come to a few verses here, verses 20 through 23. And this passage of Scripture talks to us about what it means to be reconciled with God. And we're going to look at what the Bible says about how to be reconciled with God. In Colossians 1, beginning in verse 20, as we stand together for the reading of God's Word. And by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So he's talking to us in those verses about how it is possible for a human being who is a sinner to be reconciled with God in heaven who is holy and perfect and sinless. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. May the Spirit of God be our teacher. Take your truth and impart it to our hearts and apply it to our lives and help us to be doers of the word. For we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, I want you to see with me several things this morning in these few verses. The Bible says that we are enemies of God in our sin. Now, I want you to think about that. Adam and Eve, in the beginning, were friends of God. They sinned against God. They broke the relationship they had with God when they sinned. And they became, at that point, enemies of God. Now, God was never hostile to them. God was only just. And God is never hostile to you and me. But God is just because He is holy. And it is because He is holy that He must judge sin. And so, sinful men and women cannot come to holy God unless God makes a way for that to happen. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about in these verses. We have a dilemma. We're sinners. We can't get to heaven. 
What are we going to do? How are we going to reach a God who is holy if we are not? And all the religions in the world, except Christianity, which, by the way, is not a religion, it's a relationship, but all the other religions in the world say that you get to heaven by your works, that you can work your way into heaven. Yet the Bible teaches that we cannot go to heaven by our works. It is not us reaching up to God. It is God reaching down to us. It is God who initiates our salvation because God knows that we're tainted with sin. We all know that we're sinners by birth and by choice. And because of our sin, the Bible says we are alienated from God. We're enemies of God. Our sin makes us an enemy of God. So we've got quite a dilemma. And God in His love for us developed a way for us to go to heaven. And that's what we see here. I want you to notice three things. First, notice in the latter part of verse 20, the price paid by Jesus. The Bible says, having made peace through the blood of His cross. It is unbelievable to me today. It is unthinkable to me that there are some so-called Christian churches that are removing the crosses from their church buildings because they say some people are offended by the cross. And they say that the church should take away anything and everything that offends people in order to attract people. Now that's just unbelievable to me, and I disagree with that with every fiber of my being. And I want to be candid with you this morning. If the cross of Jesus Christ offends you, you just don't need to come to church here because the cross is the center of our faith. Without the cross, we have nothing. It is upon the cross that we stand. And it just is unthinkable to me that a church would take the cross away in order to attract people. Listen, it is the cross that attracts the lost. It is the cross that saves the lost. We don't need to take the cross away. We need to put it high where everybody can see it. Amen? The price was paid by Jesus on the cross. But there were false teachers in the church at Colossae that were telling the people that Jesus was not a real human being. They said that when Jesus walked, he didn't even leave a footprint. But the Bible says Jesus died in a real body, a body of flesh and blood, a body just like you have and like I have. When Jesus suffered on that cross, he suffered in a real body. When they took those nails and, and put them in his hands, it hurt. When they thrust that spear in his side, he felt the pain of that. When that crown of thorns were placed upon his brow, it was excruciating to him because his body was real. And on the cross, the Bible says, Jesus took our sins and he carried them as far as the east is from the west. He suffered in a human body of flesh and blood and he did that for us. And the Bible says, without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no remission of sin. There is no way for our sins to be erased or forgiven or taken away. It is only through the blood of Jesus. God in heaven required a blood sacrifice be paid, and Jesus paid it with His own blood. When Jesus went to the cross, His blood was shed. His blood ran down that cross and congealed with the dirt around the cross. Revelation 1.5 says, Unto Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His blood. Aren't you thankful that Jesus paid the price for your sin? Can you say amen? amen. Well, let me show you a second thing in verse 20. We see not only the price paid by Jesus, but we see the peace made by Jesus. Now look at verse 20. 
And you see there the word reconcile. He reconciled all things unto himself. The word reconcile means literally to change or exchange. It is used in the New Testament to speak about a change in a relationship. For example, in 1 Corinthians 7, it's talking about the relationship of a woman with her husband. In Romans chapter 5 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the same word is used talking about God and man being reconciled. But when we see that word here in Colossians, it's a little bit different word, and I want you to to take note of it, this word, reconcile. It is translated here from a compound word made up of the basic word for reconcile, but a preposition has been added to it in the original language in order to intensify its meaning So the word is a a very strong word. It means to be thoroughly, completely, totally reconciled where there is no doubt. Now when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, sin entered the world, and the Bible says the whole universe, the, the whole creation was thrown out of kilter. And yet when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus made it possible to reconcile the very universe in which we live. Romans 8 says that creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now notice what he says here. Look at verse 21 and verse 22. And you who who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now he has reconciled. Who did the reconciling? He did. The Lord did. Look at verse 22. He has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. This is talking about the peace made by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says before we are saved, we're an enemy of God. We're alienated to God. We're hostile to God. Now, God loves us. He's not hostile to us. It is our doing, it is our sin that makes us an enemy of God. Let me show you what God did. Look again, verse 21. Yet now He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight, in God's sight. How does God make it possible for those of us who are sinners, and that's 100% of us, for those of us who have sinned to get to heaven, to reach holy God? Well, right here he tells you. He said we're reconciled to God. It's made possible in the body of the flesh of Jesus Christ through death. That's the cross. It's through the cross that we are presented blameless and holy and above reproach in God's sight. You know, sin is presented in Scripture in many different places. In the Garden of Eden, we see sin. We see Abel lying in a pool of blood, murdered by his own brother. Sin is to blame. Or just turn a few pages further, and you see Noah and the flood. And you can see all those bloated bodies floating in the water. Sin is to blame. Turn a few pages over, and you see Sodom and Gomorrah and the ruins of those cities. The judgment of God fell, and sin is to blame. And if you want to see sin, go to Calvary and look at that old cross and look in the face of Jesus Christ and see His suffering. You see, it was sin that put Jesus on the cross. Now, when Jesus bore our sins, now I want you to listen carefully to me. When He bore our sins, the Bible never says that He was made a sinner. Now, I want you to pay attention here so that you won't go out and say, I said something that I didn't say. I want you to listen carefully. Here's what it says. It's worse than that. What the Bible says is worse than that. I want to show you what the Bible says about this. Turn 
back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 for a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And look at verse 21, and I'll give you a moment to find this. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. And put a big star in the margin of your Bible right here so you'll remember this verse. Look at what it says. For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. For God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now, understand what this says. When Jesus bore our sins on the cross, the Bible is not saying that He was made a sinner. The Bible is saying He was made sin. He was made sin. The very thing that is repulsive to God, Jesus became. He became sin on the cross. That's what this verse is saying. Look at it. Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Get the picture. In the Garden of Eden, when man rebelled against God and turned away from God, man chose his own will, but God continued to love us. And yet, man could not get to God. So God wanted to save us, and there had to be a sacrifice. And so what happened? Well, Corinthians says that when Christ was on the cross, He became sin for us. You see, not just that He took our sin, He became sin for us. And that's why, as He hung on that cross, that God could not look upon Him because He became the thing that God cannot look on. And Jesus said, My God, why have you forsaken me? And he died there alone on the cross as God the Father turned his back because he couldn't look upon sin. And Corinthians says, Jesus was made sin for us. If you understand that, say amen. You see, that is a picture of the peace made by Jesus. Look at how he endured the horrors of hell so that we could enjoy the splendors of heaven. It's like the story of the prodigal son. There's no picture I know in all the Bible that gives us a clearer illustration of what God is like than the story of the prodigal son. And you remember the story. The younger son rebelled against his father. He said, give me my inheritance. And he took off to spend his inheritance. And before long, he wasted, the Bible says that he wasted the inheritance in riotous living, in sinful living. And where did he wind up? He wound up in the pig pen. And if you're bound and determined to live a life of sin, you're going to wind up in the devil's pig pen. Amen? I mean, you're going to reap what you sow. And I don't know how many days that boy was away from his father. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I can just imagine there was that loving father. You, if you're a parent, you can understand this. There was that father who had had his heart ripped out by his son, and he missed his boy, and he looked for him to come home. And every day, he would look out the window and wonder where his boy was, and when was his boy coming home. And one day, the Bible says the boy was in the pig pen, and he came to himself, and he went home. And I can just imagine the father looking out the window that day and he saw a figure in the distance. But he couldn't make out who it was. But as he studied that form, he knew it was his boy's walk. And he could tell by the way that he walked that his boy was coming home. What did he do? The Bible says that he ran to meet him. That's the only time in all the Word of God that you ever see God getting in a hurry. The only time that you ever see God in a hurry 
is when he ran to meet one of his wayward children. That's how much God loves us. And that's why Jesus became sin for us. The peace was made between God and man by the Lord Jesus. Well, we see the price paid by Jesus, and we see the peace made by Jesus. Now I want you to notice one final thing. Look at verse 22. It says, In the body of His flesh through death, to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in His sight. That's talking about the purpose that was displayed by Jesus. The purpose displayed by Jesus. Look at verse 22 and you see the word to present you holy. Present. That word was used in Bible times to describe an enemy to the king, to present an enemy to the king who had been conquered by the king. And you can imagine an enemy being taken to the king. But what would happen if the king came down off of his throne and instead of putting the enemy to death, he picked him up, he washed his wounds, he loved him, and he set him on the throne next to him. And that is exactly what God does to you and me if we will repent of our sin and give our life to Jesus. That's the purpose displayed by Jesus. God treats us as though we were kings when yet we have been alienated from Him. We have been enemies uh, with Him because of our sin. But God says, because Jesus became sin, if you will accept the sacrifice, if you will receive my Son, the purpose is displayed by Jesus. He is our salvation. You know, the cross divides the whole human race. There are only two kinds of human beings, the saved and the lost. Sitting in this building today, sitting over in the Christian Life Center right now, there are only two kinds of people in these rooms, the saved and the lost. And all of us fall into one of those two categories. I think about that Roman centurion. He was a Roman soldier. He was a, a natural enemy of the Jews. He got up that morning going to work just thinking nothing about putting those guys to death on the cross. It's what he did. It says in the Bible that he gambled for the garments of Jesus. He was an enemy. He didn't care. To him, Jesus was just another criminal who died on a cross. But something happened that day to that centurion. As he saw what transpired, and as he heard what Jesus said, something happened in his soul, and he was changed. And you remember what he said about Jesus? Truly, this man was the Son of God. You know, in justification, the sinner stands guilty and condemned before God, and God declares him righteous. In redemption, the sinner stands before God as a slave, but is granted freedom. In forgiveness, the sinner stands before God as a debtor, but the debt is paid and forgotten. In adoption, the sinner stands before God as a stranger, but is made a son. But in reconciliation, the sinner stands before God as an enemy and becomes his friend. And by him, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And all God's people said. I want you to stand with me right now. Here and in the Christian Life Center, just stand and bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to ask you if there has been a moment in your life a time in your life when you have made peace with God through Jesus Christ. You cannot save yourself. And the only way to heaven is the blood, the shed blood of Jesus. He became sin for you. But in order to be saved, in order to go to heaven, you must receive Him by faith. Has there been a moment in your life when you've done that? when you've prayed to receive Him. 
If not, I invite you to do it right now. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me this prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. And I'm going to ask the church to pray with me out loud after me. Just pray this, church. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Son of God. I believe you died for me. I turn to you by faith. Forgive my sin and come into my life. Save my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Now look up here. If you prayed that sincerely in your heart as an unbeliever, and you meant it, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to walk this aisle this morning. I'm going to ask you to step out in the Christian Life Center and walk to the front, publicly making a confession of your faith in Jesus Christ. We're not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen? I mean, the first thing we ought to do when we invite Jesus to save us is to tell everybody we know that He did. And it begins with a public confession of our faith. And I'm inviting you to do that this morning. Our pastors are here and in the Life Center. You come right now as we sing.